And so it begins, a new sermon series. Woo! Yeah. Some of you are like, not if it's like the other sermon series we've been doing. Those are brutal. This one is not supposed to be heart surgery for you and I. Um, this one is, is basically a sermon series where we're going to try and really bring in some practical, biblical wisdom for everyday life. So that's, that's where we're going. We're not even going to touch your heart. All of our hearts are like, forget it, man. <laughs> this church is no good on the heart. Um, I've felt it. Our staff has felt it. Some of you have felt it. But that's not why we're doing this. We really do feel like this is where we're supposed to go now. Proverbs uh, 24, verse 3 and 4 um, says that wisdom builds the house, understanding establishes it, and knowledge fills its rooms with rare and precious things. There you go. You guys knew it already. So wisdom builds the house, understanding establishes it, and knowledge fills its rooms with rare and precious things. And so basically, this is our kind of verse, our theme, our, our uh, call, our charge, our banner that we're trying to put over us, especially for this next ser sermon series. We want your households to be built in wisdom, God's wisdom, established with God's understanding, and filled with rare and precious things that only God can bring. Those memorial stones. I heard a sermon one time by a guy who talked about in King David's house, there were bear rugs and lion skins. And for those of you that know the story, King David went and fought a giant at one point, and when he was told, how do you think you're going to take on this giant? He says, well, I've already taken on the lion, and the Lord was with me. I've already taken on the bear, and he was with me, and God's going to be with me if I take on this uncircumcised Philistine. That's what he says. I know he's a little too much information there, but whatever. <laughs> But I want, I want so badly, we want so badly for your homes to be filled with things that your kids go, what's that, daddy? What's that, mommy? And you say, oh, I was just waiting for you to ask this question about that rare and precious thing that only came about because of God in our lives. Yeah? yeah. You with me? What kind of household do you have? Is it filled with those rare and precious things that only God can bring? I hope so. If not, this is what we're doing. We're going to really work on that this entire year, but particularly in this series. Wisdom builds the house. Understanding establishes it. And knowledge fills it with rare and precious things. So along with our Sunday morning ser series, ser sermon seri sermons, series, so, <laughs> sir, sir. we are also launching an online curriculum. For all of you college students, you're like, no, no more curriculum. For the rest of you, you're like, no, my life's too full. And then for the rest of you, you're like, we're too old. <laughs> That's just my guess. That's just my guess. Um, can't teach an old dog new tricks, something like that. Well, these aren't new tricks. They've been around for a long time, okay? But basically, we're launching an online curriculum, so there's no excuses, Okay? They aren't necessarily going to track exactly with our sermons on Sunday morning. We've broken up the other hours of life into five different categories. Now, there's obviously more than that, and we can talk about it and debate for hours. But basically, we have relationships. You could pop those five up. Relationships, work, rest. And rest is funny because, you know, in the Bible, you're supposed to work for six days and rest for one day. And uh, some people in the room are like, yeah, I just really need to work on the rest part because I work too much, and some people in the room need to work on the work part. <laughs> You're just resting too much. Um, but it's, it's, it's part of it. And rest is actually an interesting thing because you're sleeping eight hours a night, hopefully, or four, whatever is true. Um, rest is a huge part of our lives outside of this place. And then we have finances and sexuality. And these are all things we're dealing with outside of this. And uh, basically, the whole premise for others' hours is that God doesn't want to make you good at church. He wants to make you good at the other hours. And the other hours are basically your life. That doesn't mean he doesn't want you to be good at church. I mean, church is an important thing. 
but it's kind of a little easier to be good at church, at church, because like I was telling the worship team downstairs, they basically have been planning all week, fighting battles in, in prayer, and they come out here and they just clear the air for us, and then we're all like, man, it's so peaceful in this place. Well, somebody's putting in the work. Somebody's fighting for you and I. So that the space between heaven and earth for some reason becomes very, very thin in this place. Amen. That's why a bunch of you keep coming to me and you're like, we're coming to the church and we just feel something. It just, we just, we really get what's going on. We, and, it's, and it's the work that's being done in the spirit that makes all of this more possible. So that's the idea for other hours. We're going to launch into this. We're going to probably take about three sermons on each one. But our online curriculum is there for you to navigate at your own leisure. We really want, we have about five, four different modules, I think. And we really want you to go through each one of them by the end of the year. Now, it might be a lot to ask. I get it. But you got a whole year. And you can go with it on your own. You can get a little group and do a small group on it. We're going to offer some classes to kind of kickstart the thing. We'll tell you about those next week. But we're, want, we're wanting to see these homes filled with rare and precious things. And it takes knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And so we've, you know, searched the entire world for the best books or the best book. And we've tried to narrow it down and build study guides for you so that it's as easy as possible for you to navigate through this stuff and get it into your system. It's like legal, healthy steroids for your spiritual life. We need all the help we can get. Is that, you can't say that in church? Um, and, and, and the way that you can get that, we'll bring out all the information, but we're actually launching a whole kind of separate website. So livingstreams.org, if you go there, you can link to livingstreams.online, and it's part of our whole reach out to this online community that's forming around Living Streams in the cyber world which I don't know anything about, but some people do, so they're working on it. Um, and then it's also something that's going to help us here on just this Phoenix campus, the boring people that just show up and stuff, you know. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not boring. Just don't know about computers or something, so they keep showing up. No. Anyway, so that's the whole idea. You with me on that? Yeah. Yeah. All right, but we can't jump into that. I was like, yeah, let's do this thing, and I felt like the Lord said, stop to me. And... Uh, and he said, there's something that you need to basically remind everyone as we're about to do this spiritual, practical wisdom for everyday life is that everything in life is spiritual. I'm going to teach us a song right now. I'm going to sing it. It's short. I learned it from kids, so it's not complicated. But you guys have to sing it. Otherwise, it's going to be super embarrassing for me, more embarrassing than it already is, and I haven't even started singing Okay, so let's stand up one more time, and I want this song to haunt your dreams, okay? In a good way, right? We're talking about steroids, we're talking about haunting, all those things. We're just using it in a good way, okay? So you can pop the lyrics up. This is a song I learned in South Africa in a little village called Willowvale um, at a school, a Christian school for kids in that place, and they would sing the song, and it would sound awesome, by the way. But, uh, but this is a song, they sent, and it has haunted my dreams, and it's kind of given me some strength in times where I needed some strength. Okay, so here it goes, and we're going to break it all up, but I just want us all to learn it real quick, and then we're going to do something fun with it. Well, fun for me, maybe not you. All right. In the name of Jesus. There you go. We have the victory. In the name of Jesus. Demons will have to flee. Try it again with me. Ready? In the name of Jesus, In the name of Jesus. we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. And then the second part. When we stand in the name of Jesus, tell me who can stand before us. When we stand in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. All right, so that's the song. So first we're going to do, you guys are the first in the name of Jesus. You guys are the repeat. You guys, whatever you want to do. 
You've already done whatever you want to do, so you might as well do it with the song, too. All right, so just pick a side. All right, ready? One, two, three, four. Everybody, we have the victory. Demons will have to. All right, boys first, then girls. Ready, boys? Boo on that. Yeah, on that. We have the victory. Come on, man, let's do this thing. Yeah. Demons will have to flee. Everybody. And when we stand in the name of Jesus, Tell me who can stand before us when we stand in the name of Jesus. We have the victory. Good job, you guys. Have a seat. Yes. That was way less painful than I thought it would be. Thank you for that. And it's so funny because you never have to, like, really pump up the girls for this stuff. They're just like, boom, already, and they're singing it. It's always cool. Sorry, guys. You're, you got to work on that. All right, so before we jump into other hours, the practical aspects of our everyday life, we have to remember that everything really is spiritual. We are in a spiritual battle. Some of you might be like, oh, man, this is a bummer. Now I'm going to have to work on more things or worry about more things. And I have to tell you, that is not the intention of this. It's not to add something to your life. Instead, think of it like when you're running your chainsaw. Okay? (laughs) I have a chainsaw and I love it. I have so many trees, I don't love that, but I love that I have a chainsaw. And when it works, it's awesome. Um, But what you need with a chainsaw is you need gas, right? And you need bar oil. And I just thought you needed gas. And I remember um, going over to someone's house with my chainsaw and my gas thinking, this is going to be so cool. They're going to see me with my chainsaw, and I'm going to be, like, ripping through all this stuff they need help with, and, and then they're going to be like, wow, you're so cool. And, um, and then I got there, and I didn't have any bar oil, and I was ripping through nothing. It was, it was brutal. My chainsaw was burning hot, and these logs were just not, it was taking me forever to get through one. It was brutal, brutal, brutal. Um, and then I added a little bar oil finally, and it was just like, like butter, just cutting it through. And so what we're doing is we're not adding to your life. We're not adding to your work. You have your work. You have your work. You have your rest. You have your family. You have your relationships. You have your easy ones. You have your bad ones. You have your finances. You have your sexuality issues. Whatever it might be, you have a society that's somewhat crazy. And so what we're doing is not adding one more category. We're basically going to be inserting the bar oil into all the other categories of your life. You see, you're more than just a body. The Bible is shouting this, but people never hear this. You are more than just a body. The body's easy. Yes, I have a body, obviously. But you know you're more than that. You also have a mind and you have emotions, which is your soul. You have thoughts. You can't see them, but you know they're there. You have feelings, you can't see them, but they're real. And actually, the thoughts and the emotions are even more real or more powerful than your body. Those of you that have been to the doctor because you're stressed out, you know what I'm talking about. There is more to us than just this body. We have the soul. And the Bible makes it clear that there is even a more true you than your body and your soul. And that is your spirit. It's the part of you that God breathed into, making us human, different from all the other aspects of creation. You have a spirit. The best way I can describe it is just there's those times in your life where everything physically, emotionally, mentally, everything seems to be going great, yet something inside you is just off. Something you can't shake. Something that's heavy. That's your spirit. You're becoming aware of something, the true you. 
Or on the other hand, you've been maybe you know, to someone's bedside or someone who's, whose body is you know, racked with illness and they have every reason to be freaking out in their mental and emotional situation and yet they have such a joy and a peace about them. That's the spirit part of them. That is, that is more real, more, more powerful than the other aspects of who they are. And God who is spirit is calling out to us who are spiritual to connect with him in the spirit so that he can strengthen our spirit, so that he can give us the bar oil that we need for life, which is spiritual. Another picture you can think of is rocks in a river. They're surrounded by this water. They have no awareness of the water, and yet the river moves them sometimes. The river is hotter or colder. And we're like that. We are, we are physical beings in a spiritual existence. And the temperature rises and falls, and sometimes we're completely oblivious to it or why it's happening. And sometimes we're being moved by spiritual things, and we're completely oblivious to it. And all of that would be good if we had other religions and we didn't have the Bible, which basically kind of everything spiritual is good and everything spiritual is, is not dangerous. But the Bible says that in that spiritual realm, there is good angels and God. And then in that spiritual realm, there is also demonic, deceivers, adversary, which is what the name devil means. And as we go through the scriptures, we keep running into time and time and time again where there all of a sudden is like the curtain opened for a moment and we go, what? And we close the curtain as fast as we can. That don't make no sense. And in churches, we, we don't really know exactly what to talk about or what to deal with, so we just kind of like, hey, let's just go to chapter 6 now because <laughs> chapter 5 is crazy. Daniel praying for the people of Israel. And he's fasting for 21 days, and it's just this, this, just this heaviness, this burden, this struggle, this challenge. And then all of a sudden, an angel shows up on day 21 and says, hey, I came the first day you started praying. But I was on my way, and the prince of Persia, this demon, me and him, we had a big old fight, and I was actually losing the fight. But then this angel, another angel came and, and actually was stronger, so then I won, and I was able to finish and come here. So thanks for keep praying, you know. Glad you didn't stop on day 20 because who knows what happened. Oh, let's go to the next chapter quick. That's crazy stuff. It says that Jesus for 40 days was in the wilderness and he didn't eat or he didn't drink and the devil came to test him. And I don't know if the devil came on day one or if the devil waited till day 40. But he comes and he tests Jesus. And after 40 days, finally it says, the devil left him until a more opportune time. <laughs> it's like my least favorite verse in the Bible. But in another gospel it says, and then the devil left him and the angels came to minister to him. I like that verse. And so you and I, Jesus, we are, we are following Jesus. And, and in this following of Jesus, we can expect the same things that happen to Jesus will happen to us. Jesus taught us that. In this world, you will have testing or tribulation. We know that there's physical challenges in this world, no doubt about it. We know there's emotional and mental challenges, no doubt about it. And we have doctors, counselors, teachers to help us with all of those things. But what I, I have to make you guys understand, what I have to be, teach today, what I have to bring to light is there's also spiritual battles that you will be in and many of you are right now. Some of you are aware of it and some of you never heard this before and you think I'm crazy. I'm okay with that. And my guess is the reason that everyone I'm talking to around me right now is going through some sort of spiritual battle 
that's expressing itself in emotional, mental, or physical aspects of their life. And within our own staff, we've just noticed, man, it just feels like, what is happening here? And so we've kind of deduced it down to this, I think there's a spiritual battle going on. And me in my own home, it's funny because I, I don't go to this place quick. Some people, they're like, you know, I stub my toe. Ooh, there's a demon behind that or whatever. And it's like, nah, I don't know. So it takes me a little while to get there. I'm a little more like it, I have to have a lot of things kind of go down. I'm a little dense maybe. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, like even in my own household, you know, and especially because we brought some foster kids into our household and, and we were ready for it in all the other areas of life. But I never realized that basically we were taking on a whole battle that maybe is in their family history that we were like, hey, yeah, let's take that battle on too because we're doing so great on our own. No, I don't know. We're just, ah, you know. <laughs> so it took me a while to catch that and be like, oh, okay, I need to be like, walking around in the middle of the night praying for my family in this house because somebody else is doing something. I might as well do my thing. So anyways, I'm just wanting to bring that to light. I feel like that some of you are in it right now and some of you are not aware of it. And those of you who don't know Jesus, maybe someone brought you here and you're just like, whoa, this is crazy. Well, I, I, I can tell you in the name of Jesus, we have victory. And if you, can't, if you can't honestly say you have the name of Jesus as a part of your life, I can't promise you anything. I mean, there's stories in the Bible where a guy even who claimed to have the name of Jesus, he says, in the name of Jesus and in the name of Paul, who I've seen use the name of Jesus, but they didn't really know Jesus, and they tried to do that to some demons, and these demons came and ripped all their clothes off and beat them up and sent them out of the house. Now I'm really crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, get this. One time, my wife thought it would be cool if we went and lived in a little village in Belize where they don't have running water, and there's only like 400 people, and there's like, a, bi a billion mosquitoes for every square inch of air or something. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, so we lived there, and we were living there. We lived there for about a year. And one morning, I was sleeping in my very uncomfortable, very small, like, bed. Um, and I hear this, this, Mr. David, Mr. David, shout out from down on the, on the road, there's like one little dirt road kind of by our house. And, and there was a guy with two bikes. He was on one and he had another bike. And so I went outside, what's going on? They said, they need you at the other end. What they said, we need you down so. And so I went down there and I got on the other bike. We rode down there. And, and, and the next, basically the rest of the day, but you know, the next two hours were very intense as there was a guy there who was kind of reading all the Bible verses that talk about demons to this one mom and her daughter. And, and um, there was another guy underneath this kind of house on stilts with two friends sitting next to him, and he was just like, <laughs> going like that. And uh, I mean, I just woke up. <laughs> I already don't belong. I still had not figured out why I was there. I was just there because my wife was there and I like her. <laughs> and, and, and the guy prays you know, for the girl and then we walk down the stairs and he goes, do you have any experience in this type of thing? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't say that, but I, I, I said... I don't know. And he walked me over to the guy, and, and uh, I walked up right next to the guy, and, and I grabbed his hand, and I squeezed, because <laughs> I thought at any minute he's going to squeeze back and rip my hand off or something. And uh, he squeezed back real strong, but not, not anything that was hurting me. And, and, I, and I got right up next to him, and I whispered into his ear, and I said, 
you got to call on the name of Jesus. You got to call on the name of Jesus. You got to call on the name of Jesus. There is no other name that can save but Jesus. And, and I was kind of following him up and down and just like saying this into his ear over and over and over again. And, and after just a few minutes, he started to try and, and speak. And every time he would try and speak, he would gag. It was, it was as if something was holding his throat. And he, he just kept fighting. And, kept, and after a few minutes, he finally got out the name Jesus. And I, say, I said, Jesus, help me. Say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. And he started saying it over and over and over again as he's writhing up and down. And after literally about 10 minutes of just kind of saying, you got to mean it, you got to cry out to Jesus, you got to believe that he's the only one that can save. He will be here when you call on him, when you call on him with a pure heart. And after about 10 minutes, he went limp. And, and again, I, I don't have a lot of experience in this thing, but for some reason I just had this very strong impression to say, ask him what he sees. And so I said, I said, what do you see? Because his eyes were closed. And he said, one left. And I thought, what? No, oh, man. I said, well, how many are there? And he said, there's another one. And I was like, oh, whew, you know. Um, and I said, well, you know, you got to call on the name of Jesus if you want to be free. And so he started to call on the name of Jesus. He started writhing again. We went through about another 10 minutes of the same thing. Until finally that broke, and I said, what do you see? And he said, he's coming back for the baby, is what he told me. And I didn't know what that was about, but then they filled me in that, 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 that the demon that he saw was actually the uncle of, the, of his girlfriend, who was the other girl, and she was pregnant. And I was <laughs> what? And then I said, you see anything else? He said, I see a man in white, and he's telling me to go to the church. I said, okay, we're going with the man in white. We're going with the man in white. And so I took his hand, and we walked him down to the church, and we got to the church, and I'm not joking you. I, I had, didn't see this coming, but me and my friend were walking with him, and we walked up the steps. There was about three steps into this little church, and as soon as we got to the top step, whoo, he, threw him, he, got, he just threw himself back or something, and he was just fine. And me and my friend, we don't know if it's Christian or not, but we lowered our shoulders and hit him so hard, he flew into the church. And I don't, I don't know if you're allowed to do that or not, but I just thought, man in white, man in white, we're doing it. And so he got into the church, and, and he was calm, and we started playing some worship music because we know that that is where a lot of the battling takes place, no doubt. And uh, he stayed there for a while, um, and there's more to the story. Actually, he, you know, he stayed there, and, and then after a while he thought he was fine, and he went back, and we went into town. We came back from town, and then I found him again, they came and got me, and he had, like, garlic and crosses all over him. Um, and I went in there and kind of went through the same process again. And now he said, the man in white said, I need to stay to the church till midnight and then read this verse. And, and I was like, do you know that verse? He says, I don't, even, I don't know anything about it. And so we found the verse, and he did read it at midnight, and he was fine ever since then. And then every time I saw him after that, we would have this interesting, like, hey, man. <laughs> He'd be like, Hey. Okay, <laughs> good enough for me. <laughs> um, but again, I, so am I making this up? I mean, you guys have to decide, obviously. I, I, I'd, I'd never experienced anything like that before. I'd had those times in my life where I was asleep in my bed and I would kind of wake up and just feel maybe like a heaviness in the room or, or some sort of darkness. I did have one friend who was a roommate of mine and he, he was telling me one night he was um, in his bed and he felt like he was being held to the bed and, and, and he didn't know what it was. And so he tried to start crying out in the name of Jesus. He was a Christian. And as he would try, he said it was like he felt like his throat, something was holding his throat. And finally he got the name Jesus out and he felt released and he started walking around the house praying and I was like, you gotta move out of my house, man. <laughs> You're crazy. But, but that was not like a demonic possession that was more of an oppression where for whatever reason the devil was just kind of using that tactic to try and get him to freak out and move away from what God was calling him to um, so I'd had little things but this was this was the most biblical <laughs> sounding situation I'd experienced and again the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you guys to be aware that there is a spiritual realm and there is a spiritual reality to your life 
and you're either winning or losing the battle. And, and for you that have loved ones that are in your home or in your care, God has called you to be a covering for them. If you have a household, there is a war for your household. And Jesus is able. I believe it because the scriptures teach it, but then I believe it because I got to see it happen. That even in a strange, crazy, cultural context that I didn't know much about it, that name of Jesus, oh yeah, it did the trick. But I'm going to read some verses here um, and give us a little more insight into how we can position ourselves or operate when we become aware that there might be a battle around us. You guys know the story of Elijah and when the whole army was there to, to come and kill him. And his servant was like, you're going to die. And Elijah said, Lord, open his eyes. And he goes out again and he sees behind the army that's about to kill him is an angel army full of fire that's all around them. And the servant's like, what's up? <laughs> you know? And yet we have, a, we have verses in the Bible, lots of them. And I've picked a few of them here to help us kind of know what we're supposed to do when we become aware that this could be where we're at. If worry or anxiety or temptation or any season like that is going on for you right now, listen to these verses. For though we live in the world, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. A lot of times the spiritual battle or turmoil will show up in the thought life, and we have to stand firm against those things. We have to fight those things, but we have to remember that the weapons of our warfare are not we go fight people, we don't fight whatever's showing up in our minds, we fight it in a spiritual way. We use scriptures like Jesus did to fight off of those things and take every thought and make it captive. Does this, does this fall in line with Christ or does this not? And if it does not, we get rid of it. We resist it. Put on the full armor of God, Ephesians 6 says, so that you can take your stand against the devil's, the adversary's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Your spouse is not the problem. They might be a problem, but they're not the problem. You're a problem too, probably. <laughs> For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. <gasps> Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand your ground, the next verse says, stand your ground. <laughs> Stand firm then, and it goes on to talk about truth and righteousness and, and uh, the gospel, faith, and the word of God. I just think that's so interesting. It says, stand firm when the day of opposition comes. And after you've done everything you can to stand firm, stand firm. <laughs> just keep on standing. Just keep on standing. Stand firm. And you will see when the day comes, the devil will depart from you until a more opportune time. I can't guarantee it's only 76 hours. We don't know how long. We have different examples in the scriptures of how long you have to fight in the spirit before there comes a break. Um... 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. You're starting to catch the theme here. And then James 4 says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now there's a catch there in that re regard. Your position, what you're supposed to do is submit yourself to God, 
Stand firm in faith and righteousness and truth and the gospel. Stand firm in the word of God. And stand and stand. And when you start to feel your weakness rising and your strength depleting, continue to stand, continue to stand, continue to stand, continue to stand against whatever is coming. And resist the devil and he will flee. Now, how long do you have to resist? That's what we don't know. But if you haven't in your life recently can think back to a time where you did have to stand firm and resist the devil, you probably have been getting overtaken. Or you've probably been blaming other people or other situations for the struggle you're having in your own heart. And you're going to keep losing that battle until you figure out how to stand firm long enough to see the victory come. Because when you stand in the name of Jesus, you have the victory. So keep standing. For you, your own heart and mind, keep standing. For the people you love and have cared for, keep standing for your work environment, your school environment. Because in the name of Jesus, Demons have to flee. In the name of Jesus, you have the victory. We need some strong people. We need people who are willing to fight this battle. Or we've completely lost. And for me in my life, I, I've been doing a lot of this. I've been going back to a lot of scriptures that I know those scriptures, but I needed them. <laughs> I started leading myself in worship again. I used to leave worship all the time in college. And then I came here and they're like, eh, we're good. <laughs> Could you preach? <laughs> so I pulled out my guitar because I could just feel it. And I started just singing my songs. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. I started praying a lot more. Intentionally. And I felt, I felt something change in the spirit. And I've been able to rest a lot better. The weariness has subsided. I went to our elders meeting a couple Thursdays or Tuesdays ago, Wednesdays, whenever it is. <laughs> and they prayed for me and I just felt a whole new strength. And then the very next night I came to Freedom Immersion and this team from Washington prayed over me and my wife. I felt some strength. And I showed up that Sunday morning, whenever that was, and that's the strongest I've ever felt on a Sunday morning. Because I battle too, you know. It's not always easy coming here. And speaking out and caring for the people that the Lord has given me care for, that I really do love and want to see the best for. We're all weak. We've got to find strength in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that people right now would not feel a heavier burden. I, I remember the, you, you always had problems with the Pharisees and the religious teachers because they were adding to the weight for the people instead of lightening their load and making it easier for them. And I pray that this message would be something that really is like that bar oil that helps everything else in life just kind of become easier, that helps them with their weariness problem. That they would realize that there is a drain, there's a spiritual drain happening on the side. They would become aware of it and they would be able to take that on. And in your name and by your strength, not by might or power, but by your spirit, Lord, they would find that drain removed so that they can be full strength for the other aspects of life. I thank you for these precious people that you love so much, that you died for, that you're so close to. I pray you'd make them strong, Lord. That you'd make us together strong. That we would be a covering for this city in some ways. That we'd be able to beat back the schemes and the evil that the enemy wants to bring into our city. All the churches around here, we thank you so much for them. We pray you bless them, Lord, and make them strong in the spirit.
We're going to have the ushers come forward and pass out communion, which is one of the best places to remember the Lord and call on the name of Jesus. And we're just going to have these guys playing a little bit. And this is just your time. This is your time. Enough's been said. Now you just need to listen to the Lord and maybe you can talk to him. Cast your cares on him. And figure out what you might be saying. And then hold on to the bread and the cup and we'll take it all together once everyone's been served. a sense that some of you in this room really see yourselves as weak and frail in the spirit and I just need you to know God wants you to know that through Christ you can do valiantly you could be one of the most powerful prayer warriors spiritual warriors in the world whether every other aspect of your life seems weak and frail This is one where you can be mighty because God who loves you is mighty. And Jesus, we remember that all of our strength, all of our forgiveness, all of our hope, everything comes from this moment when you gave yourself for us. It all reduces back to the death and the resurrection that you were willing to offer your body, your perfect, powerful body to complete weakness even death on a cross so that we could have your power in us and we receive it today. Let's take the bread. And every kind of accusation that comes our way from our own hearts, from our own minds, from the people around us, from the devil himself, all of them are silenced and brought to nothing by your precious blood that is more powerful and can wash us clean. Let's remember the 
blood of Jesus and take the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. Make us strong, I pray. Let's all stand as we close with the chorus. And if you need prayer, if you want to give your life to Jesus, if you want to become more aware of the spiritual battle, if you want someone to pray for you, there'll be people up front. Take advantage of this.